Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to our, our pain workshop. Uh, my name is Richard Ross, and this is Dr. Suzanne Duncan, medical doctor here in Nantucket. So um, the theme, uh, as, as you saw in your flyer, is to the purpose of psychological and physical pain is to motivate behavior, thinking that will heal, connect, and improve. Okay, so that's gonna be our, our theme. Um, the format is that uh, we're gonna go back and forth. Uh, uh, Dr. Duncan's gonna talk about physical pain. I'm gonna talk about psychological pain. We're gonna have some objectives. We're gonna do talk about the mind-body and we're gonna end with some brief interventions or treatment if we can. So um, my introduction into pain or into mental health uh, field was uh, almost 20 years ago when I went to work at uh, detoxes, rehabs, acute care facilities, outpatient mental health, dealing with alcohol and drugs. And I saw where people were trying to escape from their pain by using alcohol and drugs. Unfortunately, what would happen is that it would work in the short term, but in the long term, it would cause them more pain. Uh, hopefully, people, if, if they bottomed out, and there's many, many ways to bottom out, they would then get enough pain to come into treatment and get recovery and, and lead uh, productive lives <coughs> after that. But first, we're gonna work on some introductions and we're gonna have to move this thing <laughs> back, back and forth, which is gonna be a little awkward, but. No and here's another piece. <laughs> Hi, I'm a Suzanne Duncan, Dr. Duncan. I'm a medical doctor here practicing on Island, also on Martha's Vineyard. And I specialize in a field called physiatry. And that was started in the Mayo Clinic in the 1930s to create a doctor who could take care of the whole person. There were a lot of uh, more veterans coming back from World War I with battle fatigue as well as horrendous injuries so they tried so they created a new residency it was a very the longest residency at that time it's still one of the longest residencies of any doctor um, we do four years of medical school and then um, four or five years of residency after that so what we specialize in is the diagnosis and treatment of neuromusculoskeletal diseases and pain is one of your very first indicators of that there's something going on it's your signal it's your smoke signal and I like to liken it to a smoke alarm Instead of dulling the pain, I think that's just the first moment where you need to start investigating and you need to find out what is the cause of the pain and there can be many multi-factors and um, that's what we're here today. The theme today, as I said, it's, it's psychological and physical pain and it's to motivate behavior or thinking to heal, connect and improve. So it's seeing pain as your friend, as not as something that is immediately something that shouldn't be there, but just a, the beginning, a directional cue as an arrow pointing. So back to you, Bob. <laughs> uh, this is this is fun. Um, but you can't hear me. Okay, you want me to? Okay, sure. You want to move forward? Want to move forward? Is that all right? Sure. And you know. Okay, sure. That'd be great. Janelle, don't go away. I'm sorry. I forgot to introduce you. Karen, do you know my daughter, uh, Mary, Mary Ellen? Yeah. What? This is Karen. Uh, Hi, Mary. Oh, Lindsay, uh, Karen Lindsay. Yeah. Yeah. And Mary Ellen. I, I'm, a little, I'm a little remiss. Uh, we're here because, uh, because of the Nantucket Community School and who organized this. Uh, J Janelle. Janelle was the adult uh, education coordinator. She did the graphics, she did the advertising, she did the emails. She got us the room, several rooms. We've changed, this is our third room, you know. Thank you all for coming, this is terrific, it's a nice turnout. So, thank you very much for having us, you know. Thank you, have a good night everyone. Okay, great. So, uh, I don't know where I was, but I think pain is part of a human experience. So I hope uh, by the end of this workshop, you'll get an understanding of where the pain comes from, what it is, where it comes from, and maybe again, some brief inter interventions to deal with it. Uh, I'm gonna uh, give my definition of psychological pain. And psychological pain is an unpleasant feeling of a psychological non-physical origin. Uh, mental suffering, these are key words. Uh, 
mental torment. And, and just to give you a, just a brief example of the two different types of pains that we're, we're trying to convey, um, pain in your foot tells you to change your shoes. Pain in your heart uh, tells you you gotta be true to your, your, deep, your deepest values. I'm getting, uh, and also I wanna thank Dan Ross for, uh, from channel, uh, channel 18, is it? For doing this. So, um, so that is why people change. People change because of, of pain, that they're uncomfortable and they need to move, move forward and, and they also need to get uh, wardrobe adjustments too <laughs> at the same time. And so, so where does, you know, from a psychological point of view, where does all this stuff come from? Well, our brains, thank you, our brains, I'm getting it from all ends here. <laughs> Our brains have a negativity bias. Okay, it's the stuff that's kept us alive for millions of years. You know, we hear sounds, strange sounds at night. Uh, somebody attacks us. Uh, a, a few years ago, there was a book called Blink. I don't know if anybody remembers that by Malcolm Gladwell. And, and he said the brain, in the 20th of a second, when you meet somebody, you can tell if you can trust that person. So we have a lot of stuff going on in a body, and Dr. Duncan's gonna get more into the brain a little bit, but, but just to give you, um, you know, a, from a psychological point of view, when we're attacked, and I'm not saying just physically, but emotionally attacked, our brain goes into the fight, freeze, or flee mode. That's our primitive brain, that's the old brain, the reptilian brain. You know, because and it and again, it's 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 meant to keep us alive. It keeps it keeps us alert, but unfortunately, um, we 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 sometimes respond too quickly. If we waited, uh, our new brain is the prefrontal cortex, and that's maybe a million years old, something which is in the front, where we do our executive functioning, be able to plan, execute, carry things out. That brain is slower than the old brain. So if you wait, remember the old wives' tales of counting to 10 or sleeping on things. If you do that sometimes, if you wait, you'll have a different response. How many of us have you know, had an issue, gone to sleep, and wake up the next day and it's not such a, a big deal anymore? So um, another source of pain is from our early experiences, our childhood experiences. These are early templates for us. Um, there are some therapists think that 50% of the reasons people come into treatment is because of what they call attachment issues. And basically, just a shorthand version of it, if you grew up in a secure attachment, of attached family, you'll be secure. If you grew up in a family that wasn't, you're either gonna be anxious or avoidant. You know, I know it's a very simple thing, but I just wanted to give you some, some background where some of this emotional pain comes from. And, Back to Dr. Duncan. I don't know if we have to keep on doing this thing. Do you want to talk about depression? Uh, should I? Oh, yeah, okay. I'll get I'll do those two and get those. Okay. Okay, so the, the two most um, uh, common psychological pain issues, or major uh, mental health issues, are anxiety and depression. Anxiety affects 18% of the population. Now, you do the math, that's about 40 million people. In the, at the turn of the century, um, anxiety past depression is the most common mental disorder we had. It, I read a study where the average high school student today has an anxiety level equivalent to a mental health patient from the 50s. So our society has really amped up and I don't know, you know, if we can explore different reasons why. But let me give you a let me give you a working definition. And, and, and you know, as we all know, some, some anxiety is good. It motivates us to, with deadlines at work, it motivates us to get things done. It's just that when it becomes pathological, that we worry about the worrying, that, uh, that it becomes a problem. And so a working definition of uh, anxiety is excessive rumination, worry, uneasiness, apprehension, fear about the future, real, or imagine, now that's, that's a key word with anxiety, the future, because it's most anxiety is future oriented. We're worrying about something that hasn't happened yet. So just, just to keep that in mind. Also, anxiety is, is an umbrella for about eight or nine different uh, 
anxiety disorders. PTSD, o OCD, general anxiety disorders, social phobia, social anxiety, there's and several others which uh, I haven't uh, hit on, but the, so it's, it's an umbrella for, for s several other uh, uh, different disorders. And then depression, which is the first cousin to anxiety because half of the people that are depressed are also anxious. So uh, it's, and, and depression is a continuum. It's a continuum from having the blues, we've all had blue days, to sad, which is seasonally affective disorder, to, to major, uh, major depressive disorders. And it's, and it's a psychological disorder marked by sadness, inactivity, difficulty in thinking, concentration, feelings of dejection, and usually it lasts for two weeks or more. Again, one of our themes here is that pain will help people motivate to change. Depression can motivate people to make changes for a better and a brighter life. Um, by the way, I just brought this here. If anybody's been in treatment, they probably recognize this book. This is the Bible of the American, whoops, American Psychological Association. Um, and this is where all the, there's 400 uh, disorders in here, including all the addictions. Yeah. Now, it's criteria. It's not, it doesn't tell you how to treat people. And it's basically used for managed care, too, because you have to come up with a diagnosis. Can you see? It's the D Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. There's actually a DSM-5. I've just been too cheap to buy one. It just came out <laughs> last year, so I still use this. As long as managed care keeps it. It doesn't tell you how to, it's very subjective, too. You know, because there is, there is no blood test. There's no lab test to, to take for depression or anxiety. It's, it's a subjective test and it depends on the skill, the skill of the uh, interviewer. So, so there's a, a lot left open there. You know, I've seen people come out of, uh, seen people with three or four different diagnoses coming out of the same, same facility uh, at different times. Um, just to give you an extent of depression, how big it is, Depression affects about 9% 9, 9 of people in the United States. That's about 27 million people. About two-thirds of the 30,000 plus suicides a year, people have depression, okay? Uh, it's, it's more prevalent in females than males. Uh, antidepressants, which there are about 40 of, and we'll, we can talk about that a little later, is the third most used drug in the United States. Um, and depression and pain co-occur, and this is where we're gonna start to intersect with the physical pain and the emotional pain. But depression occurs with illnesses and medical conditions. For example, um, cancer, 25% of people with cancer are depressed. Stroke, 27%. Heart attack, 33%. Parkinson's, 50 Eating disorders, 50 to 75%. Substance abuse, 27%, though that seems uh, a little bit low. So you're gonna, you're gonna start to see that there is a connection between physical pain and uh, emotional pain. And I think I'm gonna turn it back to you at this point, right? So did I finish, I think? Yeah. I have to, we have to do this. Thanks. Okay. So one of the things to talk about first is the definition of, of pain. And when you, what, when you feel pain in your body, what is, what is that telling you? Now, what our, what our sensory system does is allows us to interface with the environment. So, and we do that through nerves. And a lot of times people think, well, is there a difference between the mind and the body? Well, the point is really mute, mute because the mind actually is the body. We, act, we have the brain and it comes down through the brain stem and then down through the spinal cord, out, and then all these little rootlets you see, these radicular rootlets, which rad is Latin for root, they come out and that motorizes and sensorizes your, the rest of your body. And that goes not only through your arms and legs, but through your whole digestive system and everything. And so you really have to actually see the person as a walking mind, a walking brain that we're just encased in some soft, squishy stuff with some rigid stuff keeping us upright. But there really is no, there's no break between the mind and the body. The, there's the brain, 
and it com it's confluent with the brain stem and the spinal cord. So it's kind of like just kind of shift, do a paradigm shift into there is no mind body. There is just the mind encased in this encasement. So, um, and we even now are finding there are even more micro nerves. Now that we understand nanotechnology and the microcircuitry of, of computers better, we actually see that there's a whole layer of micro nerves that are actually the intelligence of our body, how we know where our body is in space, that we just thought were, oh, that's just pressure, temperature, and pinprick sensory nerves. We're, we're actually realizing there's this network that runs through the fascia and over the muscle body and under the skin that body workers through for many decades have been aware of the muscle memory or fascial memory, fascial planes. And we lost sight of it for the most part in the American system because right when the medical school started, the embalming laws were passed. That was right in the mid, um, in the mid 1900s. Um, all, all cadavers were embalmed, were, were pickled in formaldehyde. So the cadavers that you got were not freshly dug up from the grave anymore. They were actually all pickled. So literally these little nerves shriveled from view. So we didn't appreciate that there were actually this micro nerve network just under the skin and above the muscle bed. And that actually is the intelligence of that entire part of that body that influences the blood flow in and out, influences the nutrients. Nutrients don't per se come through the blood. They actually go down the nerve. And, and actually, that's how you nourish that part of that body. Um, and so what you, you see is some people get what's called complex regional pain syndrome. Well, they have an injury at a certain part of their arm or leg or especially, um, you know, after surgery or even just bumping into something and they become so tender they can't even have a sheet on it or touch it. That's actually those, a dysfunction of those nerves, of that, that network. Um, so in terms of the physical definition of pain, I want people to, to appreciate just how much that is your alarm network. That is who you are. It's not the part, a nerve is not something that's bad because it's, it's signaling you. It's actually t t communicating with you and to know that. So. That is a part of my definition. To get to highlight what you were talking about, anxiety, with my patients, I always try to say that anxiety is actually the, one of the first line, signs of dehydration or blood loss. Mm -hmm. So if you are anxious, drink two tall glasses of water, wait 20 minutes, and just reconsider the problem. You will be quite surprised at your mental awareness attitude towards that problem. Because that is, anxiety is the first sign of dehydration or blood loss, and most people are are grossly un, un, de, uh, grossly dehydrated, and um, so you want to drink two tall glasses before you leave the house in the morning, and then just try to drink a little bit during the day. Don't bother carrying your water with you; put it in you, and it's best to drink when you're at home near a toilet. And my father was a urologist, and uh, and he's and uh, one of the best say, saying. So you can be your own doctor is pee right and pee white. So you know, look at your urine. If it is clear, you're well hydrated. Make, make, make that a if, stick yeah, there. if it's if it's if it's getting a little orange and a little yellow, and you're feeling a little anxious, rethink, you know, your your water intake. Okay. Now. Um, I want to go into actually some of the anatomy of, of our body and just continue. What, what we have here, he talked about anxiety and depression. I'd like to talk about the two main issues of neck pain and back pain. So just to focus on those for today. Um, most people, I wish I had known this. I, I had terrible posture in my 20s. I don't know why. I just thought it was kind of cool to just kind of be slunched like this, you know, sitting. And I remember, I remember I had a neurosurgeon smack me on the back and say, what's wrong with you? You have kyphosis, which is actually a, you know, a diseased abnormality of the spine like that. And um, so I actually have a little arthritis in my spine because of that. And I'll tell you why people get arthritis or what they think is just arthritis in their spine. Now, this is our spine, okay? Now, we've been, for you know, at least 65 million years, we were quadrupeds walking around. And you have to think of yourself as like a horse or like a German shepherd. You have your arched back and you have an arched neck. And that's how we were walking around on four legs, okay? Then we got this bright idea to become bipeds, 
to walk on our hind legs and be like these dancing bears, okay? Now, that's fine, but the problem is is that we're tool users and we like to look at what we do with our opposable thumbs. So our heads go forward and we start looking at things like that. Now, the spine is not made to go that way. You can see it start, it's how you get these gapping. There's ligaments between each of these I'm actually gonna pass this around this is so you guys can appreciate that. There's, there's ligaments between each of, these bone, each of these bones, these spinous processes. This is the back, that ridge that you feel in your back. It's actually made to have these joints that perfectly join in to support the weight of the body. That's why you have weightlifters have their chest up and their butt out and they're you know, squatting and lifting you know, 40, 400 pounds I think 3,000 was the record in 76 with this one Russian guy. So this is where we bear our weight is down here. Now, just because we can do this doesn't mean we should, that we can lean forward like this and roll down. And there were many, many exercise um, people who were very good in many other aspects that had the wrong idea. They would say, roll down one vertebrae at the time and touch your toes. And that's... That's crushing, that's crushing the discs in front of here. There's no, there's no weight bearing area for these discs, there's nothing. If you keep doing that over time, the body will try to grow bone where there's pressure. So you see in this model here, this is a, this is a disc that's been leaned on too much, leaning, going down to pick something up like that. You have to actually put your bet out and pick something out like that. That's why people can work in the rice paddies until they're in their 90s. But you, you know, you reach down and pet your dog one morning and oh, oh my God, you know, your back goes out. It's because you've, been cru you, you've crushed that disc. This model has an actual disc that's been burst right at what was called L4-5. Now, just to tell you quickly, when people talk about the spine, what that means, there's seven bones in the neck that we call the cervical and there's, they each have a hole in the side where you get the freshest blood right off your, your heart, right to your brain, okay? And then you have these 12 bones here that are called thoracic, they each have a, a rib attached to them. Then you have these five bones here that are your lumbar. They're squat, they're, they are, they're more sturdy, they don't have a hole, and they don't have a rib on them, okay? So when you talk about L1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's what we're talking about, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These five were all separate as these were, but, and we used to have a tail, but they've all fused in time to provide a strong base since we've been upright for a couple million years now, okay? So evolution has occurred, and you still see some people who actually have the first one loose or this first one, this next one fused, and that's interesting. But getting back to L4-5, that's actually your hinge point. When you lean forward to pick something up, that's by far the most common place where people have their back issues. Now we're having issues in the neck. We've never seen anything like this. We have young kids in the ER, right? I had all the time now with, with torn discs and then searing pain because the, the, the neck is not made to bend this way. And every time, forward. forward, no, it is not made to bend this way at all, at all. And, 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 and yet it comes easily because our head is heavy. And so it comes easily. I, I try to t tell people, you know, you know, just because you can poke yourself in the eye, you know, doesn't mean you should. So just keep that visual. This is not good. This is very, very harmful to your neck over time. You can do it in the short term, but you'll find you're like, oh man, that's like, my neck hurts. There's a reason because, and you'll start getting knots in your back because your muscle actually spasm around the nerve to splint it, to hold it. And so you're instead, you're instead of stretching it apart and tearing the nerve, that's what knots are. They're actually a splint that your muscle has made. And nerves like the cold. They don't like a heating pad. The muscle loves, a heating, loves heat like an Epsom salt bath, but that's as much heat as it should get. Otherwise, you're absolutely searing that nerve. So um, just to go a little more, more about the neck um, and the back. So, one of the ways to keep that is you keep this curve. When people talk about lumbar support, it's actually a spacer in here, so you curve around that, their lumbar, your five lumbar bones curve around that and they're supported. You can see how these, these bones perfectly 
click in to each other, okay? You can see that. These, are, these, these joints are dovetailed, they're beautiful carpentry joints. Dovetail joint. And then look at the front. There's nothing, there's nothing to support that. And when you do, you can see how the back turns. So if you fell out of a tree when you're 11, or you know, you'll have certain tension or weakness of some ligaments, so you're gonna turn to the right or turn to the left, and then you'll go to a chiropractor and they will put you back into, into register. But unless you actually address that dysfunction and maybe do like, if you're turned to the left, like start doing like four you know, stretches to the right and one to the left, you can turn yourself and then you actually retrain those muscles. But to go back um, to the back, whenever you lean forward, we'll talk about this in our treatment part. We're gonna do some exercises. But um, you always wanna keep your, your tail out. You wanna keep your stomach strong, okay? We're, I'm getting ahead of our, our treatment part. But I do wanna just talk about the neck for a moment because this is an epidemic. We have never, ever seen anything like this. Yes? Is there a danger, for instance, if uh, you have a television set which is up high and raw, the opposite thing? Of yes, once that disc is back, you're right, once that disc has pooched back, then if you hyperextend back, you can pinch it more. Because there's a huge ligament here that the disc never goes forward, very rarely, rarely goes forward. It can, but it, more, it always jets back. And you can see back here, in the back, you actually have a side, a big side recess for that to pop out, and that's what happens. You've done this too much, you're picking up a muffler, oh my God, and your back goes out, or you feel a zing down your leg, and you're like, okay, I need to like learn how to lift. You don't lift with your knees, no, no, you lift with your hips. There's a huge muscle here that attaches the top of your hip. Your knee should never go in front of your toe. You lift with your hips. But the problem, what I really wanna emphasize here, before we get into the nice, exercises part, is the neck does not have that side recess. The vertebral artery is more important to be encased in this bone, you know, from tiger attack, you know, than, than down here. So this is the freshest blood coming right off the heart, straight to the base of the brain. So when that disc goes, it goes straight back into your cord, and you cannot feel it for the most part. So suddenly your hands start to curl or suddenly you, you have trouble walking, and it's actually the disc is pushed all the way into your spinal cord, and the spinal cord does not regenerate. I, I researched for years um, at the Ramy Project to Cure Paralysis before I, I started medical school, and I was implanting nerves in the, in the spinal cord, and you know we're still far away from ever getting that to regenerate. But this is the problem with when you have, especially you see young children in the back of cars and they're letting, their parents are letting them play little games and that very heavy head on that little teeny neck is going like this looking at a game as the, as the car is bouncing along the road. I mean that, that child with the laptop and the texting will be in the ER um, most likely by their mid-teens. I mean it's just, it's gonna happen because it, it has no place to go. And when you do get neck pain, it's odd. It's like a patch right here, or your thumb. You may think your, our thumbs are getting arthritis, or, the, or, or you're having this really strange patch of pain here. You don't get the zing, down, you're lucky if you get a zing down your arm, because it, it won't go and hit that nerve, and it goes into the spinal cord. Well, let me go back to you, Bob. Okay. Because I could talk about this all day, but this is of so such concern to me. Yeah, that's, that that's, I really, that's extremely interesting. If there's um, anything out of this talk for me, it is please um, watch out for that, and we will give you some exercises. Sure. I have one quick question for you. I wonder, um, you were talking about the arch in the lower part of the spine. Is it sometimes like wearing a, a short heel, but not a, not like a not like a a little heel on your shoe, and most shoes have like some kind of a heel. That kind of helps to arch your back a little bit. Does that alleviate? Um, Does that help help your posture, do you find? Or yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're connected. By yeah, <laughs> we're connected. Um, first, uh, you know, the, the heels can actually that actually will, will end up shortening your your hamstrings, and so um, we actually, if you ever get up and you find that you, your back hurts more, that's actually because your hamstrings have shortened while okay. you've been sitting, because it crosses two joints, and so when you straighten up, it tightens up, and it pulls and pulls you pulls your your tush under. 
So heels, <laughs> wearing high heels actually will make you, you tuck your, your tail under more. Oh, really? Actually. You may be th thinking you're like this, but you actually have more tight hamstrings. And you actually want that pelvis back out. When Pilates, Mr. Pilates, when Mr. Pilates started his exercises, people were a little bit hyperlordotic. People had all those bustles, and all these dancers were kind of more, more flexible. So they were like this. So he was trying to just move people to neutral. Well, right now, we're like this society of C's. So you need to, they need to stop teaching this pelvic tuck underneath. It is absolutely yeah. lethal at, at this that generation. Where they have, you know, where you go to Dasana, you go all the way down to the ground, and the sun salutation is definitely a forward movement. Right. I mean, everything in moderation, you need to stretch out okay. things. But to do, doing that chronically, you know, pulling your stomach in, that, that actually you need all your guts need all the room they have to, to digest. You only breathe by this, this diaphragm. It's like a dinner plate, this thin. It has to drop down like a bellows. Now, if you're all, if you sucked your stomach in and you're all tight, and when you suck your stomach in, you're sucking in your diagonals. That's you're compressing your kidney and your liver. All the good things you don't want to do. We've never had, we're talking about diverticulitis. We have, mm -hmm. you know, perforated bowel people in their 30s now. That was never seen before. Even six years ago, I was talking to our surgeon here on the island. And he couldn't believe, you know, you just never see that. And that's one from anxiety, and two from there's not enough room when people are, are sucking their stomach in. You want to have a strong, you make a six pack by sticking your stomach out and bearing, and those should be bricks holding your chest up like this. So, but we'll talk more about that. Um, so back to, back to you, Bob. You got it. <laughs> um, we're going to touch on mind body, we're going to touch about psychogenic pain. And I think the old, term for psychogenic pain used to be psychosomatic disorder. You know, I think that was the term that's used. So basically what it means is that there's physical pain that is caused or increased by our mental and emotional state. So uh, some of the most common ones are headaches, uh, stomach aches, and, uh, and, and back pain, you know. Um, th there's an expression that we use that, uh, where is it here? That the body remembers what the mind forgets. You know, uh, you know, our minds kind of rationalize everything, but you know, our, our body can be a bellwether when something is going wrong. Because we, we can feel, if we pay attention, we can feel sometimes the emotion in our body first before it even occurs. So, so that's, that's something that we, t and, and, there's, and there's ways to treat people that, that are, 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 are based on that. It was, uh, um, there's a couple of models of therapy that, that deal with, with that type of thing, that, uh, that the pain comes from the body first, and then, and then uh, it's something that we, we put out of our mind, but, but the, our body is, is giving us clues that there's, uh, there's something wrong. Um, do we go into treatment at this point, or you want to do some more some mind-body, more mind-body uh, stuff? This is the first time we're working together, by the way. So, we've we've been trying to. Oh, wait, you're doing great. The only I did want to touch on nar narcotics. Narcotics. Okay. Well, you know, she said that there's an epidemic of of, uh, of of neck neck pain. There's an epidemic of opiates on this island. You know, uh, it, it it graduates from people taking Percocets sometimes for very legitimate reasons. You know, they're working in the trades. They take some Percocets for back pain. Uh, and some people go on to get addiction, uh, get addicted. Uh, the Percocets increase the oxycotons, oxycodone, hydro, hydro oxycodone, uh, you know, and all. And 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 unfortunately, the, the last six months a year, we've been seeing a, a large increase of heroin use, uh, IV heroin use on the island. And one of the reasons why, because it's cheap and it's quick and it's effective and it works. So so we've been seeing an epidemic of that. Uh, go on again. This is the dull pain, and but it again, you know, in the long run, it causes causes more pain. So, and back so to I'll, you. I'll talk about that, and then we'll go into the treatment, Treat and we'll sure. do some nice exercises we'll do a to, for, exercises. to talk about your posture and things to think about. So, narcotics. Now, what do they do? They the narcotic, the opioid narcotics that. We are used the Percocets, the oxycodone, the hydromorphone, the dilaudid, the heroin. 
they give you this endorphin feel-good rush. If you're in a lot of pain, you, you're suddenly feeling good. That doesn't touch. That's not doing anything for what hurts you. It's a central, it's a central pain medicine. It's not helping your foot. It's not doing anything to your foot. And over a week and a, or a, two of it, you run into so much danger of being addicted because what most people don't realize is that you're what we call endorphins, which are your beta and meta encephalin system. That is the basis of your immune system. That is what drives your immune system. Your beta and meta encephalins, i.e. endorphins, create your C T cells, your B cells, your, your NK natural killer cells that kill cancer. At any time, each of us have about five cancers in our body. Our cells are just successfully beating them. And our macrophages that clean up everything, as well as all these other subtypes. But our absolute main four cell lines, there is and all the, in the published PubMed, the, where all the published journals are, there are article after article after article that opioids cause immunosuppression. Because what happens is that you have an outside source of endorphins. As soon as you take that, your body reads, we've got endorphins, so it down-regulates that. Otherwise, your immune system would be out of control. You'd, be hyper, you'd have a hyperimmune system. You'd start attacking your body. You would get an autoimmune disease, like many of these unexplained diseases where your body starts to attack itself. So it has to downregulate when it gets these extra endorphins. It downregulates for about a month. That's why someone who is physically addicted to um, narcotics takes a physical, physically takes one month to get back out. And then they have to address the psychological issues of, of also going towards a substance when they need something as opposed to just, you know, riding through it. But after, after a week or two, you literally have down-regulated your own system. So you literally need that Percocet to operate your immune system. So it takes the demonization out of you know, the addict. The addict is actually just trying to live. They don't realize that, and very quickly, they're looking for that Percocet on the street just to be normal. And they're thinking that's high. They're actually just getting, thinking that's normal. And you, you, can, you actually see these people who have been addicted for a long time. They, they're circling the drain. They're starting to get thrushed. They're giving themselves literally acquired immune deficiency syndrome. They're giving themselves AIDS. They don't have the HIV virus, but they are giving themselves an acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So I'm a pain doctor. I write narcotics for one patient right now who's under, who, had a, who had a horrible work accident, just fracture so many bones in his body, he's going through just another operation. And, and I had a tree trimmer last year who fell out of a tree on a stump and he fractures back and I gave him Percocet for two weeks and then that was it. It has no place, no place whatsoever on a daily basis, a monthly basis, a, mo a, a yearly basis. That is how your immune system works and you are shutting it down. So that, it, when someone is on per, you know, those narcotics, then someone, has, someone in, their, in, their, in their medical field has given up. They have stopped looking for the source of that pain and to alleviate either by their posture or by deflaming the area. You know, people should be icing. Icing is the first line, not can I have a Percocet or can you just take this pain away? You need to find out what caused that pain and then deflame it. Right. So that, that's my talk about the narcotics. It's, 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 it's just, you know, it's, it has its place. If you've, if you've burned yourself, I mean, help put you on a morphine drip. You know what I mean? If you've, you know, if you've been in a massive car accident, absolutely to, to help you through the next week or two. But you do not, it's after that you are killing your patient. And our motto is to do no harm. That's the number, we don't, we don't take 10 commandments, we take one in the medical field. It's just one, and it's do no harm. So that is my talk about the narcotics. That's the real deal, okay? Okay. Um. And, and al along with that too is, uh, and we we're going to kind of go into the little uh, touch touch on the tr uh, treatment phase of some of these uh, psychological and physical uh, disorders. Um, and you know, um, anti I don't prescribe, uh, by the way. So I'm going to speak uh, candidly about antidepressants. There's 40 of them out on the market, and just to dovetail with what with, with Dr. Duncan was saying, you know. Uh, our body, um, in theory, uh, antidepressants are supposed to raise your serotonin level, in theory. You know, that people with uh, depression have low, low serotonin, their um, 
SSRIs, they're supposed to be selective serotonin reuptakes, you know, they're supposed to raise our, our serotonin level. Um, but the, all the mega studies uh, indicate, and they've done several of them over the last, particularly last year, indicate that it only helps people that are really chronically or what we used to call clinically depressed, that for the most, for the majority of people which fall in the middle of this continuum, that it's just a placebo effect, you know? And an, another thing, and I, I think this concurs with what Dr. Duncan was saying, is that once you start taking a medication to, your body stops producing it too at the same time, because now it's relying on the pill just like it relied on the narcotic or the, the Percocet. So, so that's, the, that's one of the downsides. So I, I personally use a, a integrated approach. And what does that mean? Well, there's, when I went to grad school, there's 400 different models of, of therapy. Yeah, and they roll out a new one every day. I mean, being a marriage and family the therapist, I, I work from a kind of a family system a kind of aspect. But, um, I do a lot of integrative stuff. What does that mean? It means, yes, talk therapy, cognitive behavior therapy, which is very popular. But, but things that, there's so many things that you can do outside the realm of therapy, you know, like exercise, like walk, like yoga, like meditation, that will give you, and we're gonna do a few uh, brief uh, examples of that, will we'll give you the effect. Uh, but the problem is that most people we're, uh, you know, I don't know, it's the American psyche that we just want, we want it quick. We want it quick, you know, and fast. We want to take a pill. We don't want to do, take the 15 or 20 minute walk every day. You know, I brought some statistics about um, success rates sometimes with the, uh, with, the, with people that, that suffer from anxiety and depression. And the good news is that 80% of people treated, this is, at least this is true for the depression, showed improvement in about four to six weeks. The bad news is that nearly two out of three people with depression don't, don't come into treatment. And that's true for anxiety disorders. You know, as enlightened as we are in this, this age, there's still a stigma about mental health, you know, that you gotta be sick to go to, to, go to a doctor. Now, 50% of unsuccessful treatment is due to a patient's not following through on their treatment. I, uh, you know, Dr. Duncan can, you know, maybe confirm this too, but I give a little assignments and stuff, and most people have a hard time even with very, very short ones. So, so we have to keep on come back and we, we go through the same thing. So, um, you know, a, 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 a psychologist, I forgot his name, said this once, he says, you know, people, people want you to take away the pain, but they don't want to stick around for the cure, you know? They, they want you to, to fix it in a couple of visits and then, and then off, off they go. So is, is this a good time to go into the treatment yeah. things? Okay, so um, I'm gonna do a couple of uh, treatment interventions and then Dr. Duncan is too. Um, and I left some pads on, on the, uh, on the chairs with pens if, if you want to write, because write, one of them is going to be a little bit of a writing exercise. There's one in the back there if somebody wants to get one. I have a writing exercise too. Oh, okay, so good. So just to get, get your pens and we're going back to school. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll partake too. Oh, you're going to partake too. Okay. One of them is for here, one of them is for. There's uh, pencils, there are. I think I got some pens here. You got one? You got it? You going to share? How about you, Ursula? I've, I've got a couple more pens, or if anybody needs them. This young man does. Th this young man. <laughs> what a compliment that is. Where's the paper? We need a little bit of paper. Anybody? One more pen. No. Okay. All right. Okay. So it's. Okay. 
So this is a brief exercise that will raise your well-being and lower your depression. Close your eyes. This is called the, the gratitude visit. Call, call up the face of someone still alive who years ago did something or said something that changed your life for the better. Someone who you probably never thanked properly. Uh, someone you, you could meet face to face in the next week or two. Do you have that face now? Okay. <laughs> Gratitude can make your life happier and more meaningful. When we feel gratitude, we benefit from the pleasant memory of a positive uh, event in our life. And when we express it to others, we uh, strengthen our relationship with sometimes. But sometimes our thank yous are so brief or so casual that they, they're nearly meaningless. Your task is to write a letter of gratitude to this individual and deliver it in person, you know, and make it concrete. Write it a couple hundred words and, and go, go into detail about what that person said, what they did, uh, how it affected your life. And then, and then call that person up and don't tell them what, what you're gonna do. You wanna you want surprise them. And then read, read, read that gratitude list. And if you do this, your life will feel better. And then another uh, a short gratitude uh, thing you can do, and you can do this on a daily basis, is, is to write, write a gratitude list every day of, of a couple of things you're grateful for. You know? And again, if you do this for a month, you, I'm guaranteed that you will, well, you'll feel better after that month. And then there's just one last uh, exercise before I turn it back to uh, Dr. Do you, do you want to do the exercise right now? Well, it, it, yeah, well, well, okay, I'm going to give you the last one to do okay. here, too. Okay, write, right, right, so one is a gratitude letter that you're going to, you're going to do when you get home. Okay, uh, deliver to someone? You're going to deliver, yeah, why not? Okay. Because that's going to increase, yeah. that's going to anchor it in. What happens if they're not living? Well, things right. <laughs> <laughs> there are tombstones, you know. <laughs> um, um, and then there's a gratitude list, which you can do with, on a daily basis, you can write three things you're grateful for. And, and the, last, the last little exercise you can do, and you, this one you can do here too, is th write down three good things that happened to you today. Come on, three good things that happened to you today. And, and they don't have to be big things, it could be small things. You had, you had a, a latte at the bean, you had something nice happened, you got a parking space in front of the store, I don't know. Just three good things that happened, okay? And then, why did they happen? Because I think it's important. We've got to anchor in why, why this. And again, these are, these are simple exercises, but if you do them for weeks and a month, you, you'll, you'll, you'll definitely find, find an improvement in your depression or even anxiety, too. So that's that. Back to you, okay. I think. So, um, well, one of the mental exercises I like to do with my patients. I think I have to hook you up again. Oh, yes. <laughs> Back, to Back to the. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So, one of the exercises I like to do with my patients is called Affirmations. And there is a book called The Little Book of Affirmations. And a lot of times people do a lot of affirmations, which is to say like, I am happy, life is good, you know, everything's great. But, um, and then when you meditate, if you notice they have this term trying to, you know, still the monkey of the mind from hopping around. Well, the, there's a, I forgot the, the authors of this book, it's the little book of affirmations, it's like $15, but it's invaluable. With they, their take on how the mind works, and many philosophers have gone through the, the ages, and to think, therefore, you are. So he, instead of saying, like, I am good, you would say to yourself, why am I so good? Or why am I so happy? Because what happens is that other 80, 90% of your subconscious brain will show that for you. If you've ever, like, you know, had a good friend and, or, you know, had a crush on somebody, and I remember, like, noticing, you know, a blue Toyota truck, 
you know, and suddenly I noticed every blue Toyota truck because I liked the person driving it, you know what I mean? And so whatever you put your intention on, whatever your, your mind, runs, you're, you're looking for a certain, certain shell on the beach, it starts to look for that. And that's how the mind processes itself. And so one, you, 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 you say these things in a question form, you don't answer it. You just kind of say it like a ma mantra, like 10, 20 times. Why, and the three main ones they start out in that book, there's many, is why am I so happy? And the other one is why is life so easy? <laughs> why is life, I know. And the third one is, you know, why am I in the right place at the right time? Oh, you know, lovely. doing the right thing. I like to say, and then I like to turn that around if my mind is really in a, in a dither. And you just say that, and you can really only think of one thing at a time. And I remember my friend, a friend of mine told, told me this, a, a, a doctor down in Florida I'd helped out, and she was telling me this. It was right before I was going to a conference, and, 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 and I had to pack up and jump through all these hoops the next morning, and I was like, oh, yeah, sure. And she always has good advice, but it's hard to take advice. So I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And, uh, um, but I'll try, because I'm out of my mind with, with worry. And I remember just thinking, oh, why is life so easy? Why is life so easy? Oh, God, why is life so easy? You know? And I remember like, lying in bed doing the others. But it's, then that morning, too, it, I had so much to jump through to before I got off the island. You know what that is? It's like extracting a tooth to get off the island. And, um, so I said just like six times lying in bed, like tense as could be, why is life so easy? Why is life so easy? Why is life so easy? Anyway, I got up and oddly, oddly enough, I started finding things where they should be. I started get, packing up. I started getting things together. And the next thing you know, I was packed and, and there was the taxi. And I went outside and then I thought, oh no, I forgot my swimsuit. You know, I, and I went to my car and this is important. Instead of, and there, I opened up the back car, back, and instead of saying, oh my God, why do I always do this? Why didn't I th put this in my bag last night? I know I was thinking about it. Why do I do this? Why do I always leave something to the last moment? I, I swear to God, I, I, I opened up, I said, oh, there's a swimsuit. Done, easy. I'm out of here. <laughs> and I was like, what was that all about? It was a totally different response. Paradigm. I had, par yeah, it was a paradigm shift. So one is you stop the negative questions. You stop the, why am I always yeah. so late? Or why am I always so this? Why am I always so that? One, you absolutely stop those because you are giving your mind instructions to show you why you're so worried. Or why am I always so anxious? Why am I so anxious? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, your eyes gonna show you all day why you're so anxious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, instead of like, why am I so happy? You're gonna notice, you know, flowers. You're gonna notice yeah. things that you like. You'll be like, wow, I'm noticing I'm kind of happy or I'm noticing I enjoy this. So the book is just full of questions like that? It's just full of good ones like that, yeah. You know, why do I always have enough money to meet my needs? Why do I always, you know... A-F-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N. -E -F -F Affirmation as opposed to affirmation. And it really works. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I, I have a photocopy of the front of the book that I hand my patients and I tell them to go get. And then I, and for, so for right now, our exercise, I want you to write three negative questions you write, you say to yourself all the time, right now. So let's, let's write three negative questions that you say to yourself, just off the top of your head. Yeah, and you know, imagine yourself in a rush doing something or sad or whatever. What are the three things you will ruminate and say it again and again? And then while everybody's writing, if somebody has their three already and would like to share, please raise your hand. Okay, what was your... Why do I make the same mistake over and over again? Okay, so then now we're gonna reverse that and you say, why do I make the right decisions all the time? <laughs> why do I always make the right decision for me every time? Okay, so write, write, down, that, write down that positive one or, or a version of it you like. Why do I always make the absolute correct decision for myself every time? Can I ask okay. three that are they really, they're not, they're not formed the way you said, but they certainly are questions that occur to me every time I start to get a migraine. How will I endure this pain? What if this gets worse? How bad will this get? Okay, the first one, how will I endure this pain? Why is it so easy for me to work through this pain? Why is it so easy for me? That is just it, 
I know that it's it's shocking. Again, Why is it so easy for me to work through this pain? Why is it always so easy for me to That's work through this true. pain? Mm -hmm. The words like always and so are really good in this. Why is it always so easy for yeah. me to work through this pain? Why have always had an easy time working through this pain? Mm -hmm. Why do I always come out the other end of this pain? Mm -hmm. What I was your feel second the one? Space opening up in my yeah, you, it's actually it gets out of that mind cramp. You've been like it's this hamster pain. on a wheel. Exactly. And what was your second one? Uh, what if this gets more than I can endure? Why? Why can I always handle whatever comes my way? <laughs> That's great. Yeah, why can I yeah. always handle whatever comes my way, or a version you like okay. th that? I, I just have the name. Uh, the Book of Affirmations is by Noah St. John. Yep, yep, yep. And there's another, there's one other author, oh. too. There are two. And there's another one called The Secret Code of Success. Is that That's one? another book the authors Noah wrote. And they actually have a whole, like, a website for... Um, you know, workshops and things like that. And the great little book of affirmations. Yeah, the great, I think it's the great little book of affirmations. So it's Noah's thing. Uh, but it, but it's, the little, it's the little book of affirmations. They might have started, a, made, made another version. Do you, do you have a question? Um, why don't I go to sleep earlier? Why don't I go to sleep earlier? Yeah. Why do I always pick the right time to go to sleep for me? Why, why do I always sleep at the, perfectly, the most perfect time for me to get a good night's sleep? And you'll find, your, you'll, find you'll pattern your day so that you, you do that, that your, your body will know what time it should have to go to sleep. So why do I always know just when to go to sleep? And by the way, there's a basis in psychology for this, too. There was a Marty Segelman, who was the president of the American Psychological Association, 1991, wrote a book called Thrive. And it was the beginning of the positive psychology movement. He's since written another book called Flourish. Um, Thrive? Uh, Thrive. Thrive, yeah. And it was the beginning. And you know, when it first came out, you know, I told you there was four or 500 models of therapy. Everybody thought, well, this is another feel good thing. Well, now it's over 20 years. They've got research. They've got the They've got uh, long, longitudinal studies, and that it actually works. If there's, he's at the University of Pennsylvania, and there's a great website called AuthenticHappiness.com, and there's free testing that you can do on there, and it's really it's great because it'll tell you your happiness level and all kinds of information that you might like to know about yourself. You know, so AuthenticHappiness.com, yeah. and it's free too. Okay, so we'll just do a few more. Does anybody else have another question they'd like to share? Why am I so big at speaking in front of people? <laughs> That's what I was doing in the car. Why am I so big at speaking in front of people? Yeah, why is it so easy for me to speak in front of people? Why does, yeah, why does, yeah, why is it so easy for me to, why is it so easy? Why, why do I, you know, why do I enjoy talking in front of people? Doing very well now. Yeah. yeah. And, she sings, and she sings in front of people. Yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah. I was saying that in the car I ran to go back to get my models. I was, I was saying that because I have, I have a very good one-on-one. -on -one, yeah. And I get, I get very nervous right. over more than two people. So I worked a little bit. I haven't, I haven't turned, I haven't fainted yet. So, <laughs> but, these, but the key is to, to find the negative ones and to stop those because you, it's well-meaning. We're, we're problem solvers. We thought that would show us what was you know how to get something well we were right if you say like why do i you know hate nantucket in august and you notice the long lines or they can't find the park well there's somebody who's just arrived on nantucket and never doesn't they're not even noticing that i mean as we know through psychology perception is reality that's more or less the what the psychologists have have figured out is that you know what you perceive is your reality and everybody's personal reality is valid it's like the three blind men and the elephant you know, the first one reaches out and finds the trunk, and it's like a snake. He thinks, oh, it's like a snake. It's just like a snake. And the other one reaches out, and it's like the, the side. Of the, and he says, oh, no, no, it's not like a snake. It's like a wall. And the other one reaches, reaches the front foreleg, and it's like, oh, it's a big oak tree. It's nothing. And, you know, at the end of the fable, they, instead of stepping in each other's shoes and fleshing out the reality, they, they back away and start beating each other with their canes. But the point is, is that we all have the same arms and legs and head. 
and look at the Im Im vastly different lives we lead and look at the vastly different interests we have because we've actually created these different lives. I mean, each of our lives is so varied and so different. It's because we've put out there different things, what we want. So you really truly manifest your life. You, you are, I have a master's in sociology and I remember my, my classic sociologist teacher, he was like, unfortunately I told my, my nine-year-old son this. He goes, I told him that you, that you are 100% in charge of your life unless you've been, been in a, in, in a you know, chained to a chair and someone's like taking your hand and making an X on a contract. Everything you do, you've agreed to do. You have agreed in a social contract to do that. You may have mitigating circumstances, pressures, but you really are a free agent that has, has signed on to, in, to, to be in whatever position you're in. If you've you know, got the mobility, you just can walk out that door. But you stay and do what you do because you've decided to do it. You've manifested it. But, but for example, with my three questions, each time I ask the question, I'm so keenly despairful because I know that the question leads only to further despair. Do you know what I mean? But I didn't know the methodology of right. digging myself out of that grave. Yeah, it's a great one. But I think this is the methodology. It's wonderful. I think it's the neatest thing I've learned. Yeah. I just learned it a year ago. I teach it every day to my patients and my they they it works. I've I've tried it myself. Should we take it?